did you feel sort of alienated being of a different culture in, in New York City or you know, in America? I mean, I felt alienated in that I didn't understand many things, right? And so when we're ignorant, we get pushed to the outside. We get pushed to the surface of things. Uh, so for example, I didn't know that Martin Luther King was not a king. <music> Hi, I'm Krishnan Lavolu, and this is the Vice Podcast Show. Joining me today is Akhil Sharma, a writer whose 2001 novel, An Obedient Father, won the Penn Hemingway Award and the Whiting Writers Prize. This year, W.W. Norton & Company is publishing a second novel, Family Life, which is excerpted in this month's issue of Vice Magazine. Hi, Akhil, how are you? I'm good. It's very nice to meet you. And thank you for coming and talking to us. My pleasure. <laughs> um, one thing that strikes me about your writing, and specifically in family life, is that it's very much about the Indian American experience. Mm -hmm. um, and there are two sort of historical happenings that inform that. One, the 1965 immigration liberalization, mm -hmm. and two, the 1975 emergency called by Indira Gandhi mm -hmm. in India. Mm -hmm. um, how did those two, how would you say that those two historical nodes informed your life and your writing? You know, the, in terms of, they don't, they didn't inform my life, mm -hmm. right? Uh, because, and not to any extent that I was aware of when these things were occurring. Like I was born in 1971. Mm -hmm. uh, when the emergency occurred, my memory of it is uh, feeling quite pleased. You know, when uh, my relatives would be talking about what's going on in the newspapers, like, oh, uh, Indira Gandhi has nationalized the mines, and thinking, that's fantastic. You know, now we have the minds, like not having, having no understanding of it. Uh, in terms of liberalization, you know, as a, my father was the one who chose for us to immigrate. Mm -hmm. the, the matter to me, when I think about m me existing in history, right? And when I think about it in that sense, uh, then I am in America only because of the 1965 liberalization. Uh, and what really motivated my parents to get out of India was the emergency. In a sense, though, that 1965 moment and in 1975, not only your parents, but I think a, a large sort of generation of people came over to mm -hmm. the United States. And that kind of, in my, my reading, informs a situation that we have now, which is that there are a lot of Indians in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing that strikes me about family life is that it traces a history of that immigration. Um, and that the characters that you present are very close to your experience as a, as a person, um, but fictionalized to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. So I wonder, I guess I have two questions. The first is, you know, what, what is sort of the, the difference between your autobiography and the fiction that you wrote? And why did you choose um, to go the route of fiction rather than memoir or autobiography? Uh, the reason I the reason I wrote it as a novel is I think I can be more truthful uh, about the emotional experience that I had in the, in, through the tools of fiction. Uh, so for example, that I can use dialogue, which I wouldn't be able to use in a memoir. Uh, I can collapse time, which I couldn't, you know, if I were writing a memoir. I can take things out of context. I can blend characters together. I can ignore vast bits of my life just because I don't think they're relevant. Uh, and so all of these things I felt cr allowed me to create a greater experience, a more intense experience than I would be able to do if I were to write it as a memoir. And in terms of how is this, it tracks quite closely my life. Uh, there are various things that are not true. Um, and there are many true things that I left out. You know, but do, you know, if you were, like if our, those, those, the difference between autobiography, right, and between novel is astonishing. So for example, if you were, if I were to tell you all of these, all of the, if I were to basically read out this novel and tell you, oh, this is my life, in some ways this is true, but in some ways that would contain so many lies that I would be a psychopath. <laughs> Right? So that's so I don't think you can read it as a memoir. Right. 
but it's told through, I mean, the, the novel is told through the perspective of a young child, seven years old, I think, right. when he comes to the US. Um, and that's essentially you. You had an older brother and you had two parents. Exactly. So what, it's hard to write a novel from the perspective of a child. Mm -hmm. There's a great literary tradition of it, from James Joyce to you know, Saul Bellow, mm -hmm. people who have created characters through, or created worlds through the eyes of a child. Mm -hmm. So what were the challenges, and I guess maybe even opportunities, of taking that kind of narrative mm -hmm approach? Um, I mean, technically, one of the problems with writing from the point of view of a child is that the child can't process things, mm -hmm. right? So th the, that means that an event occurs and the child can't register its complexity, can't see all of the things that are occurring. And that causes a flattening in terms of the narrative. The, that means that you get pushed to write things that are that the novel begins to contain many more segments, uh, moments, mm -hmm. right? Uh, sort of like almost str uh, a strobe light effect. That's, that's, that's where the technical challenges tend to push you. This novel is told from the point of view of a child. It's told from the point of view of somebody looking back and occupying the point of view of a child. And so the, we have the point of view of a child, but we also have uh, the sophistication that an adult can bring to it. So it's not a pure child's point of view. But that to me sort of sounds almost memoir, memoir-esque in a sense, right? Because in a memoir you have an author who is looking back upon an event and then commenting upon that event uh, you know, with the eyes of history or mm -hmm. something like that. Um, but for this novel what you've done is sort of flatten those two perspectives into one. Is that, would you say that's accurate? <clears throat> No, I, I wouldn't say that just because the sentence length, um, the complexity of thought, the shapeliness of scenes does not occupy the point of view of a child. Uh, so it would instead be much more sort of uh, a novel part of the, of the modernist tradition, like the way of all flesh, mm -hmm. right? Where you have somebody looking back and trying to understand how did I get to this situation? So I think that's the that's where it would come. That instead of it would be a memoir, it would be more of a or a child's a novel from told like what Maisie knew. It would be more sort of a coming of age novel, like you know the portrait of the artist or mm -hmm. or the way of all flesh. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so let's talk maybe more about your personal history then, as a backdrop to the history of of the novel. Mm -hmm. Your parents came over in what year? Uh, my father came over in 78, and I, my mother and I and my brother came over in 1979. And you moved to Queens. Is, yes. That's what's in the yeah. novel. So tell, tell me about Queens. What was Queens like in those days? Because you know now you go to Queens, there's a very established Indian American right. community. There's a Jackson Diner. There are places that people go. It's a cultural landmark almost. Right. So what was it like in those early days? There was an Indian community. Um, you know, so there was an Indian grocery store. There, were, uh, there was a temple. But it was much smaller, you know, and the immigrants who came then tended to be young, right? So you would have immigrants in the night who were in their early 20s. So you had very few children, immigrant children, right? There were, when I was in school, there were no other Indians. Uh, so it was unlike now where you would have a large Indian population in the schools, it was very different. A relative of mine uh, was said that he found it so rare to see Indians that he came actually pre-65 that during his lunch hour, he would go and see the only Indian that he knew who was the doorman at uh, Citibank, uh -huh. a Sikh uh, a man with a turban. So every lunch hour he would go and they would talk. So it was a very different time. Uh, in some ways, you know, I can imagine thinking of it as a lonely period, mm -hmm. uh, but also a very exciting period. Um. <clears throat> yeah, did you feel lonely? Were you, did you feel sort of alienated being of a different culture in, in New York City or, you know, in America? Uh, I mean, I felt alienated in that I didn't understand many things, right? And so when we're ignorant, we get pushed to the outside. We get pushed to the surface of things. Uh, so, for example, I didn't know that Martin Luther King was not a king, uh -huh. right? Uh, I didn't know who Elvis was. You know, so you get pushed to the outside of popular culture. I didn't understand why anybody would care about Star Wars. <laughs> uh, so you get, 
but it was also wonderful you know, to come to America and to see traffic lights, to have a public library, to have TV, to watch Three's Company. I love that show. <laughs> you know, all of these things. So you can, I can say I'm alienated, certainly, and, uh, but you know, it would be like me being alienated when I go to Paris. Right. Um, and your brother, uh, Birju, in, in the novel, he's, his name is Birju, um, had great promise, is that right? And, yeah, yeah. and he was a sort of a brilliant young man, but then an accident befell him. Yeah, my brother, Anoop, uh, who was a wonderful young man, he got into the Bronx High School of Science, uh, was a really smart person and, you know, mature. And he had an accident in the swimming pool and uh, became severely brain damaged. And my parents decided to, he was in a hospital for a year and nursing home for a year. And then they decided to bring him home and take care of him themselves, mm -hmm. which really caused all havoc to break loose. You know, that the strain of uh, taking care of a sick person is tremendous. And the strain of taking care of a sick person uh, when you don't have many financial resources, when, you're, uh, when you've just recently arrived in America, makes it even worse. And how did that how did that affect you as a thinker, as a feeler, and how does that come out on the page as a novelist? Because so much of what was going on was in emotional, uh, it was just inside my head, it made me feel, it, it made the interior life the life that is of primary importance. You know, and in some ways that's always been true in fiction, that is that the inner life is the life that is important. But for me that seems natural. Uh, I think that would be one one thing that that uh, one difference uh, or one way it affected me. Another was that I grew up very lonely. You know, when you're so unhappy, you always feel sort of crushed. You always feel um, that life is elsewhere. You know, because it when when you're being when you're unhappy, you are being flattened out. Uh, you're almost being isolated by the unhappiness, maybe inside your own head. And the idea of sort of community is, became very important to me, or the idea of love became very important to me. And so that's, uh, these are very important parts of what I write. And I think that comes out in family life, especially as in the ways that you um, characterize the mother and the father. So can you sort of talk about how the family unit both flexes, changes, um, spikes in different ways when trauma or uh, you know, tragedy sort of befalls? Mm -hmm. the, in the novel, the, the mother becomes very religious, is religious already, but becomes even more so. Mm -hmm. The father, who doesn't really want to bring the child home, uh, agrees to do it because he feels that's the right thing to do for the mother. But under the enormous strain of it, he doesn't know how, how to bear this burden. And he turns and again and again to alcohol for the relief of it mm -hmm. and begins to drink too much. Trauma occurs and we need to be comforted, you know? Uh, and at least what happens to the mother in the book and what happened to my mother in real life was that she began to be viewed as a saintly person. Mm -hmm. So we would have all these people visit and, you know, bend down and touch her feet, you know, just as, and she, like, I mean, for a literal blessing. Right. And it beca we became um, near the center of the community, the Indian community in our town. And so it lent, it's the, that idea, the experience of that lent itself to the idea in the novel of trying to write about the community in general and its needs, you know, in the same way that we were comforted by being respected, we provided the, the community with um, people they could admire. Mm -hmm. you know, that, oh, the, that, you know, we, we Indians were good people, you know, and so it, it gave them great comfort to come to, to my mother and to see her family. And especially the fact that not only were, they, were my parents noble, but the fact that I did very well academically, you know, that gave them a great deal of comfort and pride, uh, which I'm, I'm glad that we were able to provide, you know. 
And in a way that I think from my reading, that kind of, it's a heightened aspect of the immigrant experience that you are, you're showing. Mm -hmm. And perhaps your life actually sort of embodies in a certain sense, which is that great suffering was a type of dignity. Mm -hmm. And then hard work made you, I mean, you, your life story is quite remarkable. You went to Princeton, then to Stanford, then to Harvard Law School, mm -hmm. and then you became a novelist. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what, what aspects of sort of the traditional understanding of the American in, immigrant experience outside of the Indian American perspective um, do you think was part of your life also? You know, the first thing I would say is, um, you know, this novel and novels in general, we can, they're not about, they're about the experience of being a human being, right? We, we all worry, uh, we all love, um, we all periodically feel useless, you know, we get confused. And that's the experience that this novel tries to handle. And that's the experience that all serious novels try to handle. And so we can say, okay, that this is an immigrant novel, because it is, right? Uh, but we don't say that about, you know, Henry James, right? We somehow think of that as Americans abroad. Mm -hmm. We don't think of uh, Hemingway, you know, The Sun Also Rises, or, you know, A Farewell to Arms as immigrant novels, though of course they should be. Sure. And so, you know, we can call it an immigrant novel, but there's sort of this, it's, we're not using the category properly, mm -hmm. is what I would say. Uh, in terms of what, what light this experience sheds, on the immigrant experience, what this novel uh, of the immigrant experience in general, you know, it's it's that sense of you know that things take time, you know, that you endure, and then you get rewarded, you know, that at least that's sort of how I think of it, you know, that this family endured a lot, and that t as time passes, we things get to be okay, you know, really bad things happen to my family, but things are okay now. I mean, I certainly don't think my family would have made the trade of my brother's accident, right? For all the good things that have come to us. Mm -hmm. uh, but good things have come to us. There's a certain sense when I read this novel where I feel like I'm kind of transported back in time to something that maybe my parents went through. Mm -hmm. Not literally, of course, but you know, my father came to the country in 1975. I was born in 1982. We lived in Queens, then we lived in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Um, so it paints the picture of a time and place that is part of my experience, mm -hmm. but clearly, you know, is external to who I am. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, in a, in a way, I kind of see we have sort of like a half generation between us. Mm -hmm. um, but what you're making is, and, and th this is why I, I call it an immigrant story, is because to me it speaks to the immigration of my parents that will always be a mystery to me. I'll never exactly know what it was like for them. Mm -hmm. And I've always wanted to know what it's mm -hmm. like for them. And that's why I think I'm drawn to novels like yours and to sort of other Indian American novelists mm -hmm. who have done, who've, you know, done the task of sort of charting that mm -hmm. through their life histories mm -hmm. or through their characters. Um, so in a sense, it might be unfair that I call it an immigrant novel or a, a misnomer to a certain degree. But as a community, as an Indian American community, as big as it is these days, it was once very small. Yeah, it you was know? tiny. It was great. And so I think there's a kind of, um, and it might be a sentimentality almost. I might be kind of over-exaggerating a kind of nostalgia that I'll never have. But it, it's, it feels it was a important. really wonderful community, you know, and it's a wonderful community now. But it was really sort of special when there were so few of us. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it would be, uh, you would be driving down the street and you would see another Indian in a car going by and you would both pull over <laughs> and run across to say hello. Uh, <laughs> And there was an astonishing intimacy when there were, there were only a few hundred families right, right. in a large section of New Jersey. Uh, the, the grocery stores would be open only at night and on the weekend, hmm. right? The Indian grocery stores, because there just wasn't enough business during the during daytime. The daytime. Uh, the, everybody knew everybody else and uh, was concerned. Right. And I, I'm not, and it's not, I don't think it's nostalgia, you know, it's sort of 
it was a very strong community. Uh, we were, I mean, at least I, I hope I express in, in the novel the anxiety that many people felt, you know, that uh, during that period. Right. But the community itself was also very strong. And the community now is very strong. You know, it's just strong in a different way because it's more fully developed. Right. It's more fully developed, but I think in a certain sense, like when you talk about two people who are of Indian descent passing each other in the street or in cars mm -hmm. and pulling over, that person might have been from Punjab and yeah. from Tamil Nadu, mm -hmm. right? These are two different sure. parts and of the country. And that occurred all the time. Right. Uh, whereas now, the, the sort of India has come to America. I mean, you mm -hmm. go to Edison and there are places that serve Telugu food. Sure. And there are places that serve Punjabi food. Mm -hmm. And, you know, while that's obvious, I mean, I, I think that's net a great thing. I do believe, I think part of why I am drawn to these sort of time capsules is there was a time where Indian, being Indian meant something, because of its externality, meant, meant something. It was containable. Yeah. The experience was containable. Sure, I can, I can relate to that. I can, I can, I mean, I, I was aware of that as I was writing it. I mean, I felt, um, it's, you know, I felt the, not, I wouldn't say sentimentality because this was, this is true stuff, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, the very, very generous way that people would behave, you know, the, the fact that we didn't have pundits, right? right? And so it would be just this decent person who would volunteer to do it, mm -hmm. you know, and as, as the community has gotten larger, the sense of personal giving uh, isn't as necessary, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so it's become a little bit more formalized. Right. So, I, I mean, I can, I can relate to that, the missing of it. The, I mean, obviously the things that you gain is that you, you can feel more in your place, you know, because you have a larger community. You can say, oh, here's another person who speaks, you know, Tamil or another person who, um, you know, this person came from the same region, Punjab, that I did. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, so there isn't that loss that occurs when you leave because even when we were relating, we were relating across these big gaps of knowledge. On the other hand, what it forces us is, it forces us into this greater intimacy of what is common, right? And, uh, you know, like, oh, uh, you must have felt the same way when you arrived in, in America, you know, whether you came from South India or you came from Kashmir. You know, and so that intimacy, uh, the, dim the, the, the crossing of barriers that occurred isn't as obvious mm -hmm. now. Um, I'd like to talk for a moment about the sort of quality of your prose. Uh, I read somewhere, I think Lauren Stein, the editor of the Paris Review, called it deceptively artless prose, mm -hmm. which I'm not sure if that's fair, but what, I, what strikes me is that, and maybe this comes in a certain way to how you are writing from the perspective of a child, is that it's very simple, sentence structure-wise, but its ability to convey both emotionality and sophistication sort of belies its simplicity. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, from like a very formal perspective, like how does your writing process come out with this kind of prose? And, and specifically, if, you know, I know that it took you, you know, 13 years or something to come out with this novel. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what, what is it about your deliberative process that produces prose like this? You know, the, uh, what I hope to write is prose that you can examine it, you can really shake it, and no word will fall out, right? You can, that, ev that all the words are actually there for a purpose. Um, the, my, my first novel took nine years, so it's not like, you know, I think this is just sort of the, the tempo of how I write. The way that I write is I establish the interiority of the character first. Um, you know, so I begin by just saying that, you know, that this is, you know, my father is this way, you know, and then establish, bring you into the world of these characters and then just hold you in that world. And to do that is a very, is a tricky thing. And it's very, it's tricky to do, it was tricky to do it in this novel because technically it's a very, uh, to me, it's a very sophisticated sort of novel in that um, you know how in, a, in most fiction, right, when you're generating dramatic reality, you're, you use sound, you use temperature, you use smell, 
as a way to create that sensorium, right? In this novel, there's almost no sound. Mm -hmm. There's almost no smell. There's almost no um, feel. It's all occurring on visuals and dialogue uh, and introspection. The, the reason I did this is that when you're creating, when you're dramatizing reality of the fictional moment by using all of these things, that moment becomes solid, very solid. And so you need a strong plot to drive the narrative through these scenes. This, this, the particular narrative of this novel is a small engine. Something occurs and then we watch the weight of it affecting the family. Uh, and so it isn't possible to drive the narrative through all of these scenes. So by, I, by reducing the elements of the, in the sensorium, the elements that are stickiest, right? The things that are closest to present tense tend to be sound, tend to be smell, because they exist only in present tense. Sure. And so when you begin to remove these things, you thin out reality. And so you can move through, the, move through time much more quickly. Right. As you move through time, the problem is that when you thin out reality, you also begin to make things feel very fake, right? This is the reason why we have the sensorium. Sure. And so I have to go back in and plump up that reality by using introspection, by using uh, jokes, by using all these different things to create a, a different type of felt reality. The, for me, the model for the novel was Chekhov. You know, Chekhov has very little visuals uh, and you know, relies heavily in the sensorium of, uh, uh, of sound and smell, right? And what I did was I just did the reverse. <laughs> um, and when you, when you read Chekhov, what you do, what you get is sort of this even gray tone. That's how Nabokov described it. Things are always occurring in a sort of darkness and a dimness because there's, we don't know what is the physical environment that's occurring in. We just have voices. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you read my novel, I feel that what you get is a very white tone. Like things are occurring, uh, but it's almost as if you can see through the scenes into the paper that's painted on. Uh, so it's, it's simple, you know, in many ways it's simple, but it's in, there are all sorts of weird stylistic things that are going on. And that also paints the same kind of picture. Well, rather, what that does is give you the opportunity to both be autobiographical, but also be fictional. Would you say? How so? By, by, by creating something, well, by there's, creating there's, an, an, an uh, by cre using techniques that allow a very weak engine to exist. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, I could, I could do, I mean, I could have done this by picking a stronger engine, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I chose not to, but I could have done it. Uh, you know, like my first novel is a, very, is a much more traditional novel uh, with a much stronger engine. Mm -hmm. But in a sense, that you say that the engine is, is not, a strong narrative, not, or not a strong narrative engine, but the engine is that a, something terrible happens to a family and the family figures out a way of coping with it or mm -hmm. being, being alive in that mm -hmm. moment. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> So the, the engine is the family. And I mean, the title of the book is Family Life. The, but when we think about what is an engine, right, within a novel, right, the, what we're interested in, like the different betwe difference between story and plot is the, uh, between chronology and causality, right? That's how, uh, that's how we would think of it. Like, you know, the, uh, the queen dies and then the king dies versus the queen dies and then the king dies of grief, mm -hmm. right? So, so the difference is, in plot is causality. Here, causality is extremely limited. Um, uh, you know, the accident occurs, this causes the mother to behave in a, in a particular way, this causes the father to behave in a certain way. But within, the nar within this particular narrative, these characters could have behaved in all sorts of ways. Sure. Right, they, the mother need not have been as religious. The father need not have gotten, uh, need not have started drinking, and so the causality is very weak. You know, there's no obvious reason that they began doing it this way, right? And that's that's what I mean about the difference between. St that's why the narrative engine is weak, mm -hmm. because one thing is not necessarily driving the next. And so, are you hard at work on another novel? 
Uh, I'm hoping to do a collection of short stories. Oh, is that right? Mm -hmm. And how do you feel about the differences between those two forms? Because that's sort of a celebrated debate. I, for me, the what I want from both is sort of uh, that when you begin reading something, you can't put it down. Mm -hmm. right? And uh, so for me, that's the primary experience that I'm seeking to cultivate in the characters or in the reader. The I mean, uh, the one big difference for me in terms of the short story is that I know I can put it down. You know, I can leave a story and it won't cause me emotional damage. You know, six years into writing a novel, if you put it down, you're going to have a nervous breakdown. <laughs> yeah. So that was, for me, that would be the biggest difference. So it sounds like a welcome break in a certain sense. Yeah, yeah it's a tremendous relief. <laughs> great. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. A very great conversation.